Hi guys, today we're going to be looking at Introduction to Criminal Law and what we're going to start with are basically just the general things that you need in order to have a crime and then we're also going to look at the different parties to a crime. I'm going to put the slideshow up for you guys as well so if you want to click through it at your own pace later on or when you're doing homework assignments you can do that but I also want to have this here so I can teach you um, as close to as I would if we were in class together. At the end of watching this, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments and then I'll answer them there. And if you can make them public comments instead of private comments, that would be really helpful because then your classmates can look through and see um, if they had a question, if the same question has already been answered. So let's get started here. And like I said, any questions you guys have, you can email. And I'm already getting interrupted on slide one. Go ahead in the front and play with daddy, sweetheart. You may take the rock. You're welcome, honey. Sorry about that. Oh, the joys of working from home. Okay, guys, so the first thing we're looking at here is state of mind. When we look at a crime, almost all crimes require an illegal act and a guilty state of mind. Now, note that we say almost because we're going to get into crimes that don't necessarily require a guilty state of mind later on, and those are called strict liability crimes. So what we're looking at here, guys, is we're looking at something that was done intentionally. So most of the time, we're not talking about accidents. And it usually has to rise to the level of more than just being careless. Okay, so here's the example that I use. Um, Natalie was in a hurry when she was getting ready for school. She leaves her curling iron on. The house burns down. Now, if we're just looking at what happened, a house burns down without knowing Natalie's state of mind, we could argue that this could be arson or this could be an accident. So what we need to look at is, did Natalie do it on purpose? Did she intentionally set fire to the house? If that's the case, it's arson. If it was just an accident, then it's not going to be a crime. So we can have the same result, a burned down house. But we have to look at the actor's state of mind to really determine whether or not this constitutes a criminal action. One of the things that a lot of students tend to confuse is state of mind and motive. And state of mind is not the same as motive. State of mind is your level of awareness. Am I doing this intentionally? Am I acting recklessly? Is this just mere carelessness? Motive is what we look at when we try to determine why someone committed a crime. My motive for burning down the house is to collect insurance money, right? So my state of mind, intentional, I did it on purpose. My motive to collect insurance money, this is the reason that I did it, okay? Um, it is possible for you to have a good motive, but still commit a crime. So motive isn't necessarily determinative of whether or not you have committed a crime, all right? Um, if any of you are Grey's Anatomy fans, I know some of you are, there was an issue. I don't even remember if it was earlier this season or last season. When you get old like me, children, the years start to blend together. But there was a girl who came in and didn't have insurance, and one of the characters, Meredith Grey, um, lied and said that the medication and the treatments that the girl was re receiving were actually for her own daughter. So she put her own daughter's name on the paperwork so that this girl who was poor could receive the medical treatment. Um, were her motives good? Yes. However, it was still a crime. It was insurance fraud, and she I don't think she went to jail. I think she had to do community service for it. But it was still a crime, even though it was a good motive. Okay, Robin Hood has a good motive. I'm gonna steal from the poor, and or sorry, steal from the rich and give to the poor, but technically he was still committing crimes. It was still a crime of theft, all right? <clears throat> so that's the difference, guys, between state of mind and motive. There are a few crimes called strict liability offenses that do not require a guilty state of mind. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you committed the crime intentionally or not. It doesn't matter um, what your state of mind was when you were acting. The act itself is criminal, even if you had no knowledge you were committing a crime, even if you had no intent to commit a crime. And the two examples that tend to come to mind are uh, selling alcohol to minors. Um, and after working in the high school for a number of years, it becomes very, very apparent to me that 
when you get into this particular age range of like late teens into like mid twenties, I have no idea how old anyone is. I've had students walk through my door before that look like they're 12 years old. I've had students walk through my door before that look like they were in their mid thirties. So if you're working at um, say a liquor store or giant Eagle or somewhere like that, and someone comes in and they look like they could be 30 years old and you genuinely believe that this person is old enough to purchase alcohol, but it turns out they're only 20 and you sell them alcohol, that is still a crime. And that is why when you go into a lot of these places, they card you. And I think that's why places like Giant Eagle, um, you cannot buy alcohol at all if they don't run your driver's license, no matter how, how old you are your grandparents could go in and they would not be able to buy alcohol if they didn't have their ID on them. All right. Um, the other one is statutory rape. And we're going to get into that when we get into the sexual um, assault crimes, but statutory rape, and there's particular rules that apply, but essentially when someone who is over a certain age has sexual relationship with someone who is under a certain age, all right. It doesn't matter if you think the person is older than they really are or the person in some states, it doesn't matter if the person lies about their age. You could have a person say, yes, I'm 22 and they're only 15. And if you genuinely believe that they're 22 and you proceed to have sex with them, it's still going to be a crime. So these two things do not require a guilty state of mind. And this isn't an exhaustive list. These aren't the only crimes we have but these are the two that we see um, quite often, all right? Guys, every crime is defined by elements, and we're going to live and die by the elements here, and um, you're going to get very familiar with understanding what the elements are, and the elements are basically lists of things that must have happened. This is a checklist. If you're a prosecutor and you are trying someone for a certain crime, um, it's like a checklist. It's like a shopping list. You go in with your checklist, you don't come back out unless you have everything on it. And this is why you'll often see people being charged with multiple crimes for the same offense. So you may have someone on trial for murder and they may be charged with murder in the first degree and voluntary manslaughter. Okay, so what this means is the prosecutor thinks they can prove all of the elements on that checklist for murder in the first degree, but if they don't, if they only charge them with murder in the first, and any one element on that list is left unchecked in the eyes of the jury, then they have to let the person go. They have to acquit them. So what they'll do as the prosecutor is they will charge them with a lesser offense. So if it turns out that um, the trial doesn't go well and they cannot prove murder in the first degree, maybe it drops down to manslaughter. Okay, we can check off all the elements of manslaughter. So now instead of just setting the person free, they have almost like a fallback, okay? So for each crime we go through, we are going to go through the checklist of the things that must have happened. If any one element is missing, it means that person did not commit this particular crime. It does not mean they didn't commit any crime. It means they didn't commit this crime. So please keep that in mind because sometimes we'll look at it and I'll have students say, well, they, they committed four of the five elements and that's pretty bad. So I'm going to say they're guilty. And that's not how it works. If they committed four of the five elements of the crime, they are not guilty of that particular crime. So here's an example, guys. And we're going to do robbery again when we get to um, crimes against the person and theft crimes. Robbery sort of crosses over into both of them. But these are the elements of robbery. Robbery is the unlawful taking and carrying away of goods or money from someone's person by force or intimidation. Okay. If any of these elements has not been met, then the defendant did not commit robbery, although it may have been a different crime. So let's say that you are standing at the ATM and you're withdrawing money and somebody comes up behind you and says, give me your money or I'm going to shoot you. Okay. Um, they then take the money from you and leave. That meets all of the elements. It was unlawful. They took your money. They took it away from you. Um, they took it from your person. You had to actually hand it to them as opposed to like breaking in your house and stealing it when you're not home. And they used force or intimidation. They threatened you with a gun. Okay. Um, let's say that one of you is sitting in class and you get up to the bathroom. And while you're in the bathroom, the person next to you reaches into your backpack and steals money out of it. 
that's not robbery because they did not take it by force or intimidation. Now, does that mean that person didn't commit a crime? No, they stole your money. What it means is that person didn't commit robbery. And we'll talk about the other crimes that that could have been when we get into the theft crimes. But for everything that we analyze here, guys, you're going to have basically a checklist and you're going to have scenarios that you need to analyze and you're going to have to check off whether each of these elements has been met. Okay, I'm going to stop here and make a separate slideshow for the parties to a crime so that it doesn't get too long. And I think that way when you go back and look at them, it'll be easy for you to find things if I have a bunch of shorter ones as opposed to longer ones. So we're going to stop right here. If you have any questions about anything on here, please put a comment underneath this in the Google Classroom. Um, I'll set up somewhere so that we can have like some public questions and that way everybody can see them. Okay, thanks guys. Bye.